Oh, well, you're so welcome. And I don't even have to introduce myself because you all know me. So that saves some time. And that is um, really, really nice. Um, so thank you for coming. Chloe, just a heads up, um, unless everybody else piles in through the door in the next 10 minutes or so, we'll stay together for the session. We're not going to try and break into pairs or anything like that. Let's just all, you know, stay together and have a discussion um, between us, which would be really lovely. So... I am going to um, just introduce, really, um, this notion of anti-competitive practice. And, and just to say that um, I uh, pinched that title from a book called um, No Contest, The Case Against Competition, Why We Lose in Our Race to Win. I've got to say that book is just re remarkably boring. Um, I can't say I didn't learn lots, but partly that's why it's took me four months to prepare for this, because I kept thinking there'd be something really exciting over the next page. So I'm not recommending it. Um, I've done it. I've taken one for the team. So introduction. Um, yeah. And uh, why is it so interesting and important to think about anti-competitive practice? My work, as you well know, because you're all part of it and I'm part of yours, is bringing together communities where people can think independently together. So moving good intentions into sustainable systems and culture change. And you'll see, um, you'll have seen on the first slide that I'm accompanied here by my thinking companions. So the Bowerbird, I know you know, he helps me curate those gems of insight from all around me and put them to work and he also reminds me that every curation decision I make should be grounded in my personal ethics I'm a curator I've learned that you know I am the blue shiny things person I combine them into new ways I combine old things into new ways of thinking and then in the corner of course beloved Spinoza as crocheted by Helen Osborne the guy who back at the birth of capitalism reminded us that we are all formed of the same vital living matter. He got excommunicated for, um, for, for, for that, or we believe it's that, it, there's a bit of mystery. So we share a life force and we share a responsibility to one another and my work wouldn't be my work without them. So they're gonna keep popping up in the presentation. So as I said to you, I found it incredibly difficult to prepare for this presentation. I've been thinking, reading, scribbling all summer, and it still took me till this very morning to put the final touches to it. I couldn't let it go. I talk about anti-competitive practice all the time. If you ever listen to the Joy AM broadcast, I'm always banging on about it. But at the same time, I find the whole concept overwhelming because it's so important. It's so fundamental to deep, cultural and systems change. For the past several hundred years, and only that, we've lived under an economic and political system called capitalism, and that pits us against one another in service of the market. I mean, it's, it's what it is, it's integral. Competition is integral. When I started um, a couple of years ago, starting to read what other people have written about anti-competitive practice, I couldn't find anything positive said about it because within a capitalist economy, anti-competition is a bad thing. It's people having monopolies. It's not free trade. So, you know, actually in the, the few years since, it is finally starting to emerge in uh, business leadership research, the, the, the big business schools in America, here in the UK, starting to talk about anti anti competitive practice as a really positive thing but we are where we are i'm not trying to overthrow capitalism this evening we compete for commodities and we become commodities ourselves but and this is the really big thing the really important thing when we resist the inevitability of competition i firmly believe that we're resisting capitalism too this is just such an amazing fact did you know that most of the elements of our bodies were formed in stars over the course of billions of years? Joni Mitchell knew that when she wrote Woodstock back in 1970. And I totally know I'm in danger of being accused of more hippie stuff when I say that. 
According to the National History Museum, it's possible that traces of the hydrogen in our bodies date back to the Big Bang. Now, I can't think about space for very long without it troubling my mental health. And I'm like, not joking. But it seems to me that composition like this is the basis for cooperation rather than competition. So we've had capitalism for, what, 400 years? And around the time that it really took hold, Spinoza was pointing out the folly of separating ourselves from nature and from each other. That's the post-human thing, the Spinozan post-human thing. We share a life force and none of us are less or more than each other. But humans have been around way longer than 400 years and we would not still be here if we hadn't spent most of that time in cooperation. We can't cooperate and compete at the same time, at least not effectively. And competition is always at somebody else's expense. Is that how we want to live? I'm arguing that that's, it, it, it is exactly how we live by default, whether we want to or not. So in this short presentation, and the Bowbirds really helped to curate my scattered brain, I present three traps of competitive practice and some broad suggestions for how to counter them. And then what we'll do is learn together in the discussions that follow. But first, a couple of caveats. I'm not talking about sport here. I love sport. Sport is by nature competitive and I don't see any problem with that. I'm not saying competitive or not competitive. I'm on a spectrum as always, not a binary. Sport is what it is, and it's competition that makes it compelling. And I love a good board game. It doesn't hurt to have winners and losers in sport and games. And I'm speaking as one who lost on purpose for years because my dad was such a total toddler if he didn't win. But all fitness doesn't need to be sport, and all enjoyment doesn't need to be games. Secondly, as I have learned always to say, because there are people out there who do this for a living, I'm not telling anyone how to teach. I have no doubt that many educators use elements of competition to bring some fun and jeopardy to the classroom. There's no problem with that if it's not happening all the time. All I'd ask you is, are you sure that everybody is as up for it as you are? Are you seeing the same winners and losers all the time? So it's the time I truly believe and business analysts certainly in the West, absolutely believe that it's the time for pro-social practice. I've told you about no contest and I can, you know, always share these re re uh, references. One woman's boring book is another woman's great entertainment. I know that, but it has got tiny print. And then the other book is a real old favourite. It's by Richard Sennett. You might be familiar with his book, The Craftsman, and it's called together and it's an absolute must read for anyone making a case for cooperation okay so oh here we are just um a, a little nod to something that i've heard and, and i've just started to read that i think brings together such a lot of the thinking around this when we're in a thinking environment don't we say roll rank and ego leave it at the door Roll and rank, that's easy. Honestly, by the time you've seen people try and stop rolling their eyes the first time you say where you are in the hierarchy, you're not going to do it again. Ego is hard because we've all got ego. This book is um, Brene Brown's latest um, two-part podcast on Dare to Lead, The Prepared Leader, emerged from any crisis more resilient than before. And it's by Erica James and Lynn Perry Wooten. And um, I, I've, I've got it on Kindle. I'm about halfway through and it's brilliant. It's so simple. I can really recommend it. And they talk about um, being humble enough to allow others to take the lead as the situation dictates. And this brings us to the first trap. OK, so the first trap is the ego trap. In everyday life, we see the ego trap everywhere. And most commonly is the Tommy Toppet. So we all know one. Whatever you say, they've done one better, immediately turning the conversation round to them. I am absolutely certain that someone is coming to mind for you right now. Most recently, I heard a Tommy Toppet close down a story about someone waiting four hours for an ambulance. And then the tale was that he knew somebody who was waiting nine. Where can you go with that? It's impossible to figure out if it's even true. 
you can't have a conversation, you know, they've just shut you down. And what's happening, of course, is that everything has triggered their ego. So when we are breathing the air of competition, why would it not? And it's not just Tommy Toppet. We all struggle with our egos. Keeping it in check is the work we have to do on ourselves in order to do the work of our lives. Sometimes our ego speaks for us before we even engage our brain. I've seen it happen. And I've had plenty of messages from people who've sort of done it and then got in touch afterwards and say, oh, my God, I feel really guilty. I feel really ashamed. Um, you know, I, what did I do that for? There's no shame in the fact that we absorb those messages society gives us about the hustle. We all do it. But there's deep joy in working on that ego, resisting it and getting where we need to be anywhere where I'm not saying I'm not got an ego. I'm not saying my ego don't come into the room before me sometimes, but I've been working on it for years now. And I don't think it stopped me getting anywhere just because I've stopped it with the sharp elbows. So that's trap number one. Trap number two is the rivals trap. So this is the thing. For every winner, there's a loser or a whole host of losers, like somebody loses. The system pits us against one another and we barely even notice. You're here. You're part of the FE tapestry, as Chloe calls it. People who put energy into working with others rather than against them. So you're sold on collaborative working. It's intentional with you. Any practice can forget its good intentions, though, when it's under pressure from the waters we swim in, our culture of rivalry. And it's super easy to start thinking of individuals as rivals, maybe because they behave competitively with us. And other organizations literally are market rivals because that's how the system works. We compete for students. I always think about 2008, actually in Oxford. I did a shout out to colleagues to reach out to their local adult and community learning service. I never heard that ever happened anywhere. And I kept asking, you know, so when there's partnership working, there's always a boss organization, isn't there? So that rivalry stays there even within and perhaps particularly within formal partnership working. And of course, worst place for this, social media. FE socials pretty decent compared to the tanker sharks, which is school's Twitter. LinkedIn is becoming ridiculous. I had someone on the phone in tears to me today about how, you know, something that had happened on link LinkedIn, people just diving on. I'm not referring even just to the snidey stuff, but it's the hustling. Somebody asked a genuinely open question and 10 people straight in there hustling their published work, which is tangential at best it doesn't answer the question but all of this only reflects the culture of our workplaces back to us the truth is our words betray us despite our good intentions which leads me to trap three sound like i'm at the greyhound racing don't i <clears throat> the systems trap <clears throat> excuse me so the systems trap is where it all plays out Anti-competitive practice is exhausting because it's literally swimming against the stream. Competition is built into our systems, not least in the language we use. And I include emojis in that. Whose posts do you take time to like? Whose posts don't you bother to comment on? I'm going to say something now, and I know this is really challenging. But even on the broadcast in the morning, <clears throat> I noticed that, say, somebody says, the I don't know, it's the birthday or the poorly or something. I notice some people get more like hearts or hugs than other people. And they're the people who are sort of known in that community. It's not OK. How do we draw people in? Really notice that stuff. On social media as well, I notice the guys praising the guys, the white people praising the white people creating filter bubbles and deepening inequalities tweet by tweet. Don't get me started on people who steal other people's work and don't reference them. The opportunity to give somebody credit for an idea that's inspired you. I think that's an, an amazing thing to be able to do. And we all stand on the shoulders of giants. But even when we talk about best or better than, even in relation to ourselves, we are encouraging competition. When we publish league tables, when we norm, reference, exam results like GCSEs, 
so that even if everyone does brilliantly, the same proportion still lose out. When we operate under a system which expects us all to be outstanding, and yet the grading spiral rarely feels encouraging. I haven't got the latest figures, but a few years ago, it was on its way down, less outstanding colleges. Is norm referen referencing happening with Ofsted? Nobody will admit it. When we set up competitions in class, and I mean, not just a, a bit of fun, right? I, I, I'm not trying to stop anybody's fun, but competitions sometimes relate to, you know, this person's always the hard worker. This person is always um, the high achiever. In FE, oh my goodness, sometimes this person's got the most astonishing, tragic life story. We do that. When we have staff or student of the year awards, when we roll out the same students as the usual suspects to governors, we're buying into competition, even when it's about hard work rather than achievement. How does it feel not to win year after year, and particularly staff awards, where people sort of stick around for longer, obviously? I still resent being told I couldn't be head girl 40 years ago, despite winning the student vote. So do you see the same people, staff or students, getting the kudos? favoritism. Brene Brown says that when you see favoritism, you know you've got termites in the walls. The incredible hierarchies we have, the tussles over job descriptions, whether you can be called a manager or not, really? Is this the work of our lives? No. Spinoza reminds me that all this noise is a way of making us forget that we are stardust. So what's the antidote? Well, Obviously, the answer is community. You know, nobody's going to be very surprised at that. Of course it is. But specifically tonight, I'd like us to think about three pro-social practices which build trust. A great way to make the ego seem ridiculous. It's such a relief when you don't have to hustle anymore. So in our thinking space, but all together, really love us to think about attention, apology and acknowledgement. I'm just going to briefly introduce all three of these. Attention, of course, there's a whole literature around it. Really recommend um, Amishi Jar's book, um, I'm just looking, Peak Mind, that's it, I'd forgotten the title, which is around the neuroscience of attention. Of course, it's one of the components of a thinking environment. Everywhere you look now, thinking about that um, podcast with Erica and Lynn on Dare to Lead this week and last, people are talking about paying attention, particularly in a digital age. In the Unlocking Us podcast, Brene is talking with um, the Gottmans, John and Julie, and they're talking about their latest work, which is around turning toward people, not turning away or turning against them, paying attention and how small acts of attention really build trust. This includes citation, it includes remembering who to credit, particularly if they're from a group that gets overlooked, who you notice, who you don't, termites in the walls and all of that. Apology is something we absolutely don't do enough because it's in many of our working environments, it's not okay to make mistakes, so we hide them. It's so hard to apologize for messing up. Um, there's almost an expectation of perfection around behavior. Apology is really interesting. It involves forgiveness on both parts. Apologizing, of course, owning it, trying to repair it, vowing to do better. But then forgiveness on the other side. How good are we at that? Thanking, acknowledging the apology, accepting, and the chance to begin again. I wish we had more apology. I would love to hear people. And when I say that, I don't mean that apology where people say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just for being there or speaking or whatever. And then finally, acknowledgement. If we appreciate the person and recognize their work, and I mean that really specifically, really saying, I really saw what you did there and noticed my, my friend Vicky she runs a fitness studio she, she's she's been open since we came out of lockdown and I went I went to the loo for the first time there actually the other day and I noticed she's got like lovely pictures and you know a little basket full of toiletries and 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 sanitary protection and all of that stuff and I came out and I said oh really that is so thoughtful I'm really appreciating that she said two years that you're the first person who said anything 
she's used to me saying, oh, I think you're brilliant, Vic. But actually to appreciate, to recognise her work and appreciate her thoughtfulness is where feeling valued comes from. So just to close my bit and um, with still plenty of time for us, my work is all about finding levers for systems and culture change. Anti-competitive practice is one of those. And I use this term rather than cooperation or collaboration. It's not like me to use a sort of negative term, but that's because I want to get past good intentions. If I asked you whether you worked collaboratively or cooperatively with students, colleagues, you'd probably say yes. But in practice, even with the most genuine intentions, you'll find you work hampered on a daily basis by the demands of competition because they're inscribed into our systems, cultures, processes and hierarchies. Some people out there will say they do it and they bloody well know that they don't. So I use the word endemic about competition. When something is endemic, we barely even notice it anymore. So that's really the only place in my work that negative creeps in, just for people to wake up and really know what I'm talking about here. I think that's probably it. And uh, let me just check as soon as the slide. Oh, yeah, just to get in touch slide. But, you know, you all know how to get in touch with me on my various spaces anyway so um i think yeah that's it i'm going to stop sharing